Right, well, yeah, let's let's crack on. So, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for all coming. Good evening. This evening. Um, of course, the plan was for everyone to be at Burfield today, but judging by the hail and the crazy wind we had here, I'm not sure we would have missed that much anyway. Um, as Patrick said, club sailing's kicking off in a few weeks anyway, and then open events hopefully after the 12th of April. So, um, yeah, we thought it'd be a good idea for some of the National 12 experts to uh, share their tips and tricks and try and get us all a bit quicker around the race course. And we'll kick off with Tom and Med. They've got a secret seven tips, which uh, makes everyone go, well, makes them go a lot faster than the rest of us, allegedly. Uh, any questions should be put in the, uh, in the Zoom chat and then uh, some of the uh, five speakers will answer them accordingly rather than sort of shouting out as they go. I think that'd be appreciated. But yeah, I'll, um, I'll hand over to Tom and Meds. Uh, well, I, over to Meds, who's done all the hard work. So thank you, Meds, before we get started. Do you want to uh, share the screen, George? And we've also got um, uh, Andy Davis, or Taxi, if you want to call him Taxi, who uh, may well join in uh, as, as we go through this. So I'm just going to... Thank you. Before you say that, Meds, obviously a lot of a lot of people know Meds and will probably know me if you've done any of the open meetings and nationals and things, but you might not know Taxi, who is, who heads up is is HD sales. Um, so um, there are quite a few national trial sales made by Taxi kicking around the fleet now. So uh, thank you, Taxi, for coming and joining us. Ah, thanks, uh, thank you. So uh, is that sort of. Uh, my seven secrets or the secret seven, which I th thought were fun. And uh, for those who don't know, that's uh, uh, Nigel Waller and Rory Gifford being famous uh, at the 75th anniversary uh, regatta um, where they won a pursuit race. Um, and they didn't start that far ahead. So crack on to the next slide, please. Uh, my big theory is that fast national 12 sailors are able to use the available wind power more effectively to create boat speed than slow national 12 sailors. That's all it is. And fundamentally, I've outlined four things they do better. They set their rig up better. That means they get the mast rake and bend right. They think about how their jib sheeting works. They think about the depth of their sail shape. They frequently adjust their sail leech, which means moving the kicker. Uh, they then sheet their sails better. They steer better. And they position their crew weight more effectively. And if that wasn't enough, finally, they're fit. Uh, they keep calm under pressure and they make good decisions. That's all it is. But don't worry, there are seven uh, steps maybe to, to that success. So uh, next slide, please. So I've been Downing Street again. These are my secret seven uh, ideas. Um, and we'll go through each of them one by one. There's something you can do on the beach, something to do as soon as you get on the water. We'll talk about trim. We'll talk about kicker. We'll talk about sheeting the jib. And we'll talk about things we do when we go round marks, principally the windward mark and the leeward mark. But before we go on, was anyone around when that photograph was taken and do they know what it's all about? I did it. It was me. Sorry, guys. That's the mast off, uh, off, off Windfall. And we built the land yacht at Landudno on a windy day. And we cruised up and down the beach at a really high, high rate of knots. It was great fun. But it was me and Waller and John Sears and Rob Peebles who put the thing together. And I think it may be, is it John Sears that's driving it? I don't know. But anyway, it was great fun. If it's, I can't imagine there were two. So that must be the one we did at Landudno. Looks like Landudno. Definitely looks like Landudno. Anyway, let's crack on. Um, first one, uh, things you can do on the beach. Uh, next slide that is. Um, and the top corner, that's Bruce doing something on the beach at Timmouth. That's not entirely what I'm thinking we should be doing on the beach. <laughs> um, what I think we do on the beach is take the cover off our boat and, 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 and we talk to people. But we can also, um, as we're rigging, uh, really think about what the weather forecast is and what the setup uh, that we are going to want on our boat when sailing upwind for the conditions of that day. So it might be very windy, you might want it raked. It might be less windy and you want your mast to be upright. If you go to the National 12 website, 
there is so much information uh, on um, uh, tuning your boat and setting it up. I'm not going to go into that uh, right now because that information is all there and you can uh, read it at your leisure. And you need to read it at your leisure to be able to do this uh, because if you're going to set yourself up for the day, you need to know some uh, measurements about where you want your mast to be in your boat and you want to know things like rig tension. And if you're not sure about it, you can ask your sail maker because they will know what they have designed uh, your rig to do. Uh, I don't like measuring everything every time. So what I have done is uh, during a long winter or a lockdown or something like that, ideally I'd have my boat at home on the lawn and I would be able to mark uh, the boat. Unfortunately, the boat uh, is safe and inside, but it's not at home and I can't access it. But I would have markings on my boat and I'd mark a, my jib halyard comes out the mast and I, and I have a metal hook that goes onto the wire and I would put a mark on my mast or a number of marks on my mast that I can move that to. And I would also mark my shrouds near where I cleat them so I can put them into the same place as well. One of the key things you need to know is where your upright position on your mast is. And the key thing then with that knowledge, if there is less wind, you want your mast more upright. The other thing you need to think about when you're setting your boat up uh, is to get the mast bend right. So it's not just getting the angle, the rake of the mast correct, but it's the bend that you want today. And that means adjusting your ram or your lower shrouds. It's all quite easy to do on the shore because you can step back and have a look. You can even talk to other people who are doing the same thing about what they're trying to do. It's a really good way to get a top tip. Next slide, please. So it's easy, we've got on the water. Um, and here's Tom in the top right hand corner on the water. And he's just going through some pre-start checks, I'm thinking. And he's checking that what he has thought were the conditions are the right conditions. So he's sailing upwind um, and he's making adjustments. So what, what, what do you need to consider? My, the key thing for me is how do I know I've got the right mast rake for the conditions? Well, if I can pull my sails in all the time, like Tom can in, in this picture, I would be thinking, should I rake my mast yeah. more upright a little bit? Um, and if I can't pull my sail in all the time, I'll rake it back. Tom, you wanted to come so yeah, Matt, so you're absolutely right. And what I'm, what I'm looking at there, and I'm sure I'm mid-race there because I look like I've hiked quite hard for a bit and getting a bit tired. Um, but yes, effectively, that when I'm going upwind before the start, I'm thinking about rig tension and rake the whole time. Um, I will go out on the water with my rake set to where I think it should be for the conditions. Um, but I, I definitely don't just leave it there. In fact, I move my rake around as the wind comes up and down. So it's, it's, it's the whole time. It's one of the sort of very principal controls I use in the boat for powering up and depowering. And you're kind of right. So when I'm sailing upwind there and it looks like the boom is sort of, you know, maybe four, five, six inches off the centre line, I'm probably thinking, hmm, I'll live with that for a couple of minutes. But if it's more than a couple of minutes of sailing uh, and I think the wind's increasing or it's going to hold the same, I'll drop another uh, inch of rake, which, uh, or sort of an inch on the jib halyard or half inch on the jib halyard and pull on the shroud until I'm getting that boom somewhere back towards the center line. Um, looks like my, inter my internet has gone a bit wobbly, so I hope you can hear me. Um, so, and as I drop the rake, I would then tighten up the shrouds to match. So if my lured shroud is flopping around, I'm sitting there thinking, well, my mast healing to lured and my jib halyard is not quite as tight as I'd like it to be. So I'll be pulling my shrouds on just to bring them back to the point where they've just stopped sort of moving, if you like. So the lured one is definitely not flopping around. Um, and when we talk about upright rake, um, worth experimenting with, but I find in the National 12 or my National 12s anyway, there's definitely a position, unlike the Merlin where we do sell, but very, very upright in light winds. Um, there is a sort of a, a sort of a rate number which I don't tend to go beyond. Um, I've just found it seems to stop the boat. Uh, and back to you, Meds. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so there was an interesting uh, thing that came up in the chat, and I'll deal with it now. And I think Patrick was saying, "How do I mark the shrouds?" Well, it's interesting. I've got I've got more than one National Twelve. Um, my favourite National Twelve. Um, I have got a fine tune and course on my shroud so that I, on the course I just pull the shrouds to a certain thing and then there's a, a knot in the rope and I can't pull it more. And the other end is connected to both shrouds and it's a fine tune. 
Um, and I just use the fine, so I, I use the fine tune to pull uh, on, the, on the shroud so the lured shroud um, is not floppy, as it were. On the other boat, where I don't have the fine tune, I've just got my black marker out on the, on the, on the white coloured rape. It's important to have white coloured rape. You can buy it from all good chandlers like Fox's Chandler in Ipswich. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. Um, trim. So trim is uh, all about uh, fore and aft uh, uh, position of the boat. That's uh, Tim Hampshire in the top right hand corner. And I like this photo that I found on the 12 website. Um, not sure who it is who's crewing, but they're really tucked forward, nice and low. And I'm pretty sure they're really far forward in the boat. Trim's important because our boat goes by going through the water, the water to go underneath the boat as efficiently as possible. Don't want the bow particularly up, I don't want it particularly down. I think it's even more important the heavier you are, which is important to me. Um, I judge my trim by looking at the water that's leaving the back of the boat. I, I look for sort of bubbles coming up and if I see those bubbles, I hate them, I have to sit further forward. So two things at the bottom. In my boat, the thwart is not a seat, it's not a resting place, it's, it, it's there for structural integrity. Um, and I find that if people are sitting on the thwart frequently, uh, particularly when we're going upwind, um, that it's not as quick as I'd like it to be. Uh, and interestingly, when we go down uh, in my favourite boat, uh, I often get my crew to sit on the foredeck uh, when goose swings uh, and we're not planing, um, which is pretty aggressive compared to what people do, but I might be a little bit bigger than most of the people in, in the back of the boat. The trim is really important, sailing fast. Fourth one is kicker, kicker, kicker. Um, found the photograph in the top right um, uh, on the 12 website. Uh, the boat on the left hand side, double three, double four, has got um, not much kicker, it's light winds. Uh, I think the sail looks really quite nice. Um, the sail in the top right has got an awful lot of kicker and I can tell that from the photo because I can't see the sail numbers. So this is what the kicker does. The kicker sense controls the amount of twist we have in the sail. Um, sail twist can be good in the right conditions and it can be bad uh, if uh, in the right conditions. So in, when it's windy, I want to pull the kicker on a little bit, but when it's less windy, I, I want this twisted sail. So it's really di big dilemma for uh, people who are not yet sailing really fast to work out how much kicker to use. A fact I think is true is that faster sailors generally use more kicker. I also think that faster sailors adjust the kicker more frequently than slower sailors. What the more kicker does is it gives me more hiking power. If I've got more hiking power, I think I can sail higher upwind. Um, Taxi's probably got his head in his hands because it's doing something entirely different uh, from a sailmaker's perspective but that's what it seems to do for me. When it's light, um, I allow the main sheet to override the kicker. So that means when I pull the main sheet on, I can see um, the kicker looks loose and floppy. Um, I have the kicker cleated though, so that if I do attack uh, and let go of the main sheet, uh, the, the kicker then comes back in, into play. Um, trying to set my kicker, I look at the top telltale. Um, to see how nicely it's streaming. That's the telltale that comes out of the top pattern. Uh, another sort of dilemma you can have when it gets quite windy, particularly if you've got a not very stiff mast, is the more kicker you use, the more your mast bends. And if the top of your mast bends, that means your shroud, uh, where your shroud goes into the mast has got closer to the deck and you end up having a floppy shroud. So you have to pull on more shrouds. The more shrouds you pull on, if your mast's already bending, the floppier your shrouds go. Um, taxi, I don't know if you've got anything you want to, to add about how badly I've, I've explained what the kicker does? No, no, I mean, I think, I think you, you kind of explained it in a nutshell. Um, yeah, I mean, we could go into a little bit more depth about it. Um, and I suppose it kind of comes down to uh, what your pre-bend is and, and, and how you've got your spreader set up as well. Uh, and when you're kind of looking at spreader set up, you know that's obviously straighten the mast or bending the mast and and again that will have an effect on how much kicker you end up pulling on but you, you're kind of right a lot of people just it's either on or it's off um i always try to tell people to calibrate their kicker and and i just have um i have like a, a little piece of elastic that's attached to the top end top block of the kicker which then runs up to the 
top of the boom and then along the boom um, attached to a, a piece of string and the, 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 the knot that it can just be, it moves up and down the boom then and you can kind of see this calibration. Uh, I find that's quite, quite critical uh, and I can kind of match that in with my light to medium wind, wind settings. But um, yeah, I mean, effectively, if you pull more kicker on, you are going to increase mass bend, you are going to flatten the sail and you are going to increase leech tension. In flat water sailing conditions, you can get away with sailing, sailing with a lot of kicker on, but what you too tend to find is a lot of pond sailors uh, who are used to flat water sailing, once they get on the sea and the chop and the waves, um, once they start putting on a lot of kicker on, you tend to find them pinching a bit too much and then they're kind of what I call just chopping wood, the bow goes into the waves and it's just bouncing up and down and, and they struggle to kind of keep the boat speed up because the boat always wants to climb. So uh, again, it's that then comes back to you probably want a little bit more twist in the in the mainsail. So it's um, you know that there's always two ways to skin a cat, uh, and and a lot of the you know kick attention can come back to flat water or whether you're on the sea. So it's um, it's worth making a note of that. I'd say. That's brilliant. I've got a new uh, thing to a piece of elastic to put on my back. Ned, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I've come up with the uh, the far sailor who didn't ever use kicker or not very much kicker, and it was Chris Mayhew, um, who, sailed, who sailed the boat to, to sort of go back to taxi, saying there's more than one way to skin a cat. And Chris Mayhew used to sail a National 12 incredibly fast by pulling the boom on the centre line, but sailing with masses of twist. Um, it can be done, but I have to admit, I find it really difficult. And I think uh, being able to use the kicker on can give you a lot of height up wind, which is something that Chris, Chris never managed. Um, so but there is definitely more than one way of doing it, but I think most most people, certainly when there's breeze, more kicker. Yeah, is the thing we only need to coach. <coughs> yes, I agree. I, when we go coaching, we tend to do most of our coaching in land. Um, yeah. and I definitely find that the the message I'm giving to a lot of people is pull your kicker on harder. Should we go to the next slide, please, George? You want to get through these? Um, it's all about sheeting the jib. The jib doesn't have a kicker. That's a bit of a nightmare. So how do we control leech tension? Um, picture in the top corner is Graham and Zoe controlling their leech tension. Um, how you do it with the jib? Um, you've got a jib car on uh, most modern boats. Um, I don't. Dave, do you put a jib car on your vintage boat? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. So the jib car enables that lead that the jib uh, comes through before it goes to the crew's hand to be moved. Uh, and, and that by moving that, we can change the amount of uh, tension we put down the leech of, of the jib. So faster sailors will move the jib forwards when they rake so that they can uh, pull the sail harder down the leech as the, the sort of the angle, the geometry of the rig changes. Uh, they also, uh, in lighter winds, uh, will ease the jib a little bit more to get increased drive because um, what they're trying to do is to go a little bit quicker. If the boat can go through the water a little bit quicker, there's more flow attached to the centerboard and that enables them to point higher ultimately. Um, and I also think that fast boats pull the jib harder, relatively harder than slower boats when it's windier. So there's this sort of range of control of the jib that's important to realise. Anything to add from the former sailmaker and the current sailmaker? I'd probably just say that um, with regards, quite obviously there's a, there's a lot of lot of variance in design. Um, the only thing I would probably say is that, and well, what we see in the Merlin is the distance between the turning block on the jib sheet into the distance of the clue. And um, we find that the, you know, though when the distance is great, you tend to find that sheet tension is more critical than jib car position because you can kind of move the jib car one hole and it, it doesn't really have a great effect, whereas jib sheet tension tends to have more of an effect. But if the, if the cleat or the turning block is very close to the clue, then a slight change, uh, you know, one inch or half an inch makes a massive difference to the sheeting angle. So then that, that kind of takes over. So again, it kind of depends on the design of your boat, where you've got your sheeting, you know, whether you're sheeting to the floor on the boat and you've got almost 
it's nearly a metre. Then jump sheet in jump car position probably doesn't well two one or two holes won't make a huge difference, but sheeting it in an inch harder probably will. So it's yeah, it's just making note of how you've got your jib set up, I suppose. So yeah, they say one of one of my pre-start going back six Med, meds had a picture which he said it was pre-start. One of the pre-start things I'll do is having sailed up and down the beat a little bit and decided on where I think the rake is going to be, I will then set the jib car. And when I set the jib car, I I will move it backwards or forwards, depending, but to say that when I've got the jib sheeted in, I've got the all three sets of telltales flying, breaking evenly um, before I start a race. Um, and obviously when you vary the rake, it does vary a little bit, but, you know, you're generally going to find yourself in about the right place, but it's one of those pre-start things I do every, pretty much every time. I mean, often the jib, the rake's the same as it was in the last race and the, and I don't need to move it. Um, but it might be you're using a different jib or whatever it is. Um, there's generally, but it's certainly one of the things I always check pre-start, um, add, it, add it to your list of things. Something I wish I checked regularly, I might do better. Shall we go to the next slide, George? Um, so when we're Mark, um, I wanted to talk about how we go around the mark uh, and what the, the process is and what our priorities are. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, at, the, at the end of this, we'll just talk about what you can maybe leave out when it gets quite exciting, which is what I think is happening in, in, in the picture that we've got. Anyway, we get to the mark. Um, the first thing for me to go around it is I need uh, my boat to be uh, well balanced and well trimmed uh, so we can steer easily. If your boat uh, is healing uh, in the wrong, you can heal your boat to, uh, to windward and it will help you bear away. If you're healing to leeward, um, that, that heel will want you to turn up towards the wind. So I think it's vital that you have your balance correct so that you can steer easily. And I also think you want to have your trim uh, correct. Uh, you might want to move a little bit further back if it's uh, a little bit windy um, and you think you might be planing as you leave the mark. Uh, sail setting and steering are the next most important thing to do. So in reality, you haven't had to uncleat anything to get your balance and trim right um, or indeed to start steering. So ease your sails uh, to assist steering. Let's make our life really, really easy. So the important, first important thing is just to go around the mark. Uh, I remember sailing uh, with the kids and they'd be very excited that we'd arrived at the mark and think we're about to do some jobs and want to jump into the boat, start doing jobs. And the most important thing was to stay up next to me before we did the jobs. The first thing I want to do after I've decided I've kind of got round is ease the kicker. To be fair, it's also something that I could do before I get to the mark and quite a lot of people I think might put that number one because bearing away with the kicker ease can be easier. Um, we want to raise the centre board. It reduces surface area. It's particularly important if it's light winds. You've just got this drag in the water that you're, you're, you're taking around with you and you don't need it. Um, and I think critically to people who sail downwind quickly, they move the rig. Um, they will let the lure shroud off. Um, if they're raked, they will pull uh, the mast upright um, uh, to give more power. Uh, I pull on the jib halyard um, uh, regularly. When you do that, if you've got your mast bend control on there, you need to ease that or you can put your mast over the, the front of the boat and it doesn't look very, very nice. Finally, um, outhaul is pretty important for going downwind, particularly if on a reach, less important easing it on a run uh, and ease the Cunningham. Um, if you read the tuning guide, the section was written by Graham on that and he says only wallies have the Cunning Cunningham pulled on downwind. Um, clearly, uh, you can divide these jobs between the helm and crew as to who does what, um, and thinking about leaving out things when it gets exciting. I certainly um, wouldn't worry too much about moving the rig when it's exciting. Uh, Tom, what do you? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, firstly, um, when you do the jobs, so on a certainly on a championship course, on a big course on the sea. If I'm comfortably on the ley line and you're sort of three boats from the windward mark and you're laying, um, then um, I would like to get some centreboard up because that's going to help me bear away. And I'd like to get the kicker dumped before the windward mark. Um, and I communicate quite firmly with my crew quite often about, you know, come up to me, come up to me, um, stay with me on the side deck until we've born, fully borne away. 
um, and they say I'm those are the things I'm very worried about coming into the mark and if you can do those jobs before the mark it's great and sometimes if you let the alcohol off before the mark as well um, just so that we're we've got absolute power on maximum power on as we go through go around the mark um, always looking to get a smooth rounding hopefully not trying to do anything too sudden um, keep the speed on. I don't know if anyone's watched the America's Cup, the fastest the boats go is sort of say bear away around the windward mark and it's quite from the same for the 12. Um, you know, you want to keep that speed if you can. So try not to sort of do anything too sharply with the rudder. Um, always try and sail with the rudder, uh, with the flow over the rudder. Um, try and never stall it. Uh, and for people with winged rudders, um, if, it, if it's looking a bit breezy, um, make sure you've eased some rudder before you go around the mark because by the time you're nose diving, it's a bit late. Um, so <laughs> think that, yeah. Down, down, down. <laughs> yeah, best avoided. Okay, well, we're getting to the end of the, the secret seven. Um, so uh, let's move on to the final one. We've done the win with Mark. We didn't go to the jive Mark, because we're all good at jiving, so we don't need to worry about that. And we've ended up at the <laughs> level Mark. Not sure if it was a run or a reach, but we're there. Um, so we, we, what are we considering as we go um, uh, into the Leeward Mark? I think the key thing to realise, if it's windy, the key priority at the end of a, a windy National 12 reach is to make sure you get there. Some people fail to uh, execute the last bit of the reach because they put their head in the boat and, 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 and don't sail the last bit as well as they could. But let's imagine we're not in uh, survival mode. Um, I, don't, I assume the boat in the top uh, right-hand corner didn't survive, but maybe it did put it off. Um, I, I always think if we can, let's get some jobs done early. But if there are, we're gonna do some jobs, the one job that I would leave until last um, is, is my kicker, because I don't want to get blown in at the end of the leg. Um, so we need to move the rig back to its upwind position, but that's all right because we've marked it previously and we know it off by heart. Well, I want the board, the board uh, put back down against the upwind position. I don't worry if we don't get it all the way down. I want my crew to have a go at getting it down. As I say here, don't fanny around. Um, and what, 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 that's important because we're still trying to go really, really fast and we want to steer accurately and we want to keep sheeting well as well. I want the boat kept flat, I want trim better than it is in the picture um, and uh, right at the end as I, as I steer round the mark hiking, crew not trying to pull the centreboard, I want that crew sat next to me as we pull the sails in, I'll pull the kicker on. Because I find that if I make a pretty rubbish, if I, I haven't done all of my admin um, and life is a bit of a mess. I do find that if we're both sat on the side and we try and sort things out, we don't tend to lose too much. But if we're not both sat on the side, um, we just lose distance um, when we've got it wrong. So finally, we're both sat on the side, get that board down, sort out the mess. Um, if it is really, really exciting, like in the picture, um, Tom, what would you do? Yeah, uh, what well, I'm hoping to avoid, oh. We still meeting on. hoping to avoid getting to that picture stage uh, where we're nose diving um, when it's like that and it does like depend sort of where you are looks like Northampton uh, and who you're sailing with I mean I've, I've sort of as I've been sailing with Robert for a few years now um, when he was very small um, we just used, used to arrive at the lured mark with it all hanging out um, you know out haul off kicker off and not worry about anything else because the important thing we could do when he was really small was just to go around the mark start going upwind and once it's upwind the boat's under control so i don't worry too much if i haven't got the board all the way down as long as i've got half board unless i'm trying to hold a lane after a mark in light winds medium winds it's different but in, in breezy stuff i'm not too, i'm not even too worried about the outhaul although i'm aware that as soon as i've gone around the mark not having the outhaul on is really slow um, but if he can't get the outhaul on first time then it's much better to have him back in the boat, keeping the boat upright. Um, you know, there's no point having the outhaul on once you've capsized. So, um, yeah, sort out the mess later is the key. Um, but yes, the answer is, if it's possible, get the jobs done early. Um, I like my crew to do the jobs. Um, I much prefer helming. Um, that's, that's, I feel I'm better at it, really, than crewing. Um, so, um, but really good communication to the crew. Um, so if you, you know, if you, if it's a bit hairy as you're coming in, I say to them, don't worry about the plate, you know, don't worry about the outhaul. Um, make sure, make sure they know what you're thinking. Mads. 
<laughs> I, I enjoyed that advice. Um, I've just we were talking about the America's Cup earlier. I do love how calmly the guys in the America's Cup are talking to each other um, as as they're going up um, forty knots. Um, crack on to the last one, George, please. Look, we've only got limited time here tonight. Um, sadly, it, it's not just um, the seven secrets. Um, there are lots of other little bits of insight you can bring to your sailing to make them better. Um, this is Jeremy and Luke Hartley um, hiking particularly hard. I think they'd seen the camera. But anyway, I hope <laughs> you a good start um, and uh, be happy to uh, uh, take some questions if, if there are any uh, right now. Oh, we're there. It's on colour review. <laughs> <laughs> Have we got any questions? Stick in the chat. I think Tom was writing a lot to add in the chat. When you're talking about fast bend, what are you looking for? In terms of your sail shape, what, what, what's the things we should be looking at to know whether we've got mast bend right? Taxi, do you want to, do you want to fire in there? Yeah, I can do, yeah. yeah. Um, well, again, I suppose um, if you've got a lot of, if you've got over bend, um, so you probably find that um, you're probably going to notice that more in, in when the breeze starts to come up and you're starting to pull on kicker and 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 as you pull down on your shrouds and add rig tension uh what you probably find is the uh, is the mainsail starts to starve and and you get those funny creases that come out of the clue and head up at, towards about half height towards your spreaders uh and that's just showing you that the uh, the mainsail is kind of being pulled completely out of shape uh and there's not enough material there left so um yeah that's kind of the the big the, the, the big kind of key thing to spot um and and, and often you know it yeah that's that's the main thing and, and i suppose you can get a lot of that out you know people start pulling on cunningham to remove those creases and that's bringing the draft forward but effectively when you get a lot of mass bend it's just an indication of the luff is getting the, the entry angle on the luff of the main side is getting very straight or you know, straight and, and you start getting those creases so you know that's that's a sign of overbending and i suppose if you went the opposite way if your mast is too straight or slightly inverted um you tend to find that you get a lot of uh, the entry angle on the main saw gets very deep very quickly um so then you know you probably then finding you using kicker earlier to uh, to try and flatten the main sail off to, to get the look looking how you want it. So um, there, those are two extremes really. Does that answer that? That was, that was brilliant. Uh, Tom, um, I can see that, that there's uh, a question that came uh, from the Gifford household and it was about um, how do you depower with bend or rake? I, I, that's something I've seen you doing. Um. Okay, um, well, the, the sort of going back through through history a little bit, um, sort of the, the 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 John the John Sears method was to keep your mast pinned at deck level and just sort of bend it around the mast gate. And and Chris Atkins maybe didn't quite when it was, these are the people who were sailing fast when I first joined the Twelfth Fleet. Chris Atkins didn't quite do the same, but he didn't tend to move his mast chocks and he tended to. Um, just let the mast bend more and more and more um, as he dropped the rake. And so he wouldn't necessarily tend to move the mast around so much, we'd move the rake. Um, I tend to rake back, um, as I said earlier, um, and try and keep my mast relatively straight. Um, I just find keeping, maybe keeping the ability to point, keeping the ability to hold the leech tight, um, I found has worked for me. Um, over the years um so i tend to start by start by dropping the rake and as i drop the rake i tend to find i'm pulling pulling the ram on obviously there's a point where it gets so windy that i stop worrying about what the ram's doing um and i'll just pull masses of rig tension on um as well as raking um to induce bend uh and i've been quite surprised to have come off the water and put a rig tension meter on my boat occasionally in sort of Looked at my boat and wondering how it's still still hanging together with the amount of tension I'm using. Um, so um, yeah, when it's windy, I'll I'll do whatever it takes to get that mainsail flat. 
um, uh, but preferably flat without the starvation creases um, that Taxi was describing. Um, does that does that help, Anthony? It does, but I think, I think there is a bit of a fashion thing here that we've changed, you know, the move from metal masks to carbon masks and carbon masks with foils from carbon masks without foils. We have, I think, all changed a bit as to how much we do one versus the other, which is the point of my question, really. Um, and I think because I've done so little or so much less 12 sailing since 2010 compared to the couple of decades before that, um, I'm still tending to bend rather than rake, whereas you guys have gone back to raking rather than bending, which is a bit of a, a change that I have, I've been quite slow to adjust to. I can, I can remember 12s I had where we never, basically never adjusted the jib halyard. And it worked. You know, I don't think in, in 3431 we hardly adjusted the jib halyard at all and it seemed to work. Um, I, can, I can remember 112 wondering why we didn't have a bunch of hooks on the mast for the jib halyard rather than the whole fancy set of blocks and a hook going up and down the back. Um, but clearly, I mean, clearly it does work and it has changed. So that was the reason for the question. Yeah, I like rake. I just keep it pretty upright and lean out personally. Um, <laughs> um, there's now a, you're all the pies. <laughs> that's what we all aspire to. Have your, have your physique and be able to do that. Yeah. Um, we probably need to move on, but quickly, what do you look for um, when you're looking at the top telltale, Thomas, in terms of balance between braking and streaming? Okay, so I did, I did write some stuff earlier on the forum, but the, um, so for those you don't know, I used to make sales as well, a sort of a few years ago, but um, we were always looking for, um, which we'll come back to in a minute, but the light, in light winds, you know, so sort of less than five knots or five knotish, you're looking at keeping that top tail streaming the whole time because you're trying to stop the boat from stalling and you definitely want your jib tail tails streaming, including the leech one. Um, but you need to know where that edge is. So you've got the kicker eased enough, but actually in the puffs, so when it's sort of the bigger sort of puffs you're getting in the day, you're pulling the, pulling the main sheet really hard. And at those, at those, those points, maybe the seven knot point where you're starting, to, or you're starting to move the crew towards the windward side of the boat or up towards the side deck, you're overriding the kicker. That's, that's sort of the moment you're overriding the kicker and you're pulling the main sheet really hard. And, and at that stage, you're just sort of edging to the point where the top tail tail is stalling. Um, as it gets a bit breezier, um, it's harder to make that top tail tail stall. But even but on the Penelon back sails, it was possible to um, make the middle tail tail stall a little bit before the top one. Um, and um, that was something we used to look for in sort of um, seven knots, or we still look for in seven knots to sort of ten knots. That kind of that kind of growing pressure. We're trying to make the middle tail tail just make know the leech is stood up. Um, but you're still trying to keep that top tail mostly flying. Um, it might just stall intermittently in the light bits. And, and at that point, obviously it's stalling. You probably need to let a little bit of kicker off and free up a bit and keep the boat moving faster. Um, obviously when it's breezy, breezy, then you, the, you know, the tail tails are going to fly. Um, and again, we're back to that sort of point of how much kicker can I wind on before things get distorted, if you like. Um, so that, yeah, I hope that helps. It was helpful, I think. I'm going to round off with one final question, answer, which is a question from Gareth uh, Brown, who is trying to get to grips uh, with uh, rear main. Um, and Gareth asked for a couple of tips. I think tacking with a rear main is all about your feet. Um, so you need to think about where your feet are going to go. It's quite a wide boat if you've got a modern boat to, to get across. But I try to take some region, reasonably large, but quite delicate steps um and i want to uh i because i'm facing the back it means the foot that is closest to the front of the boat crosses the boat first and then i seek to pivot and get up and hit those straps as quickly as i can the other thing to do is i think to not oversteer the corner to give yourself a little bit more time to get over there but i think it's all about your feet uh, that's that's definitely something i've found i think uh um, it's making sure that uh, 
I focus on my feet so I don't uh, sit there with the with the rudder on too long and just end up uh, you know turning far too far. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'll swap hands first. Yeah. And then move your feet, and then think, yeah. and think about where your feet are going. But in Gareth, I'd say in light winds, in light. I what boat have you got, Gareth? Uh, Crusader. Yeah. So in, in light winds uh, and light to medium winds. Um, slow it probably slow it down and tack much more slowly than you think you might need to um, it could be six seven seconds from side to side easily um, and in really light winds even longer it, it's not a race to get across the boat in light to medium winds it's much better to do it nice and smoothly and come out of the tack facing the right way uh, bringing the boat upright at the end of the tack um, to, to give yourself a bit of acceleration yeah don't rush it and practice helps Definitely. I think it's uh, definitely a case of time in the boat for me at the moment. Yeah.